Hi, good evening to all of you once again. So without further delay, let's start the lecture. So um, for an organizer, it's really nice to see a house full even before we begin the lecture. So it also generates high hopes from the resource person. I'm pretty sure they will uh, deliver what you're here to listen today. So let me introduce the moderator and the curator of this series and uh, hand over the series to her. So Sunela is recognized as Sri Lanka's leading environmental architect by The Time magazine. Sunela Javadana's award-winning projects include Jetwin Viluena, Colombo Court, Rainforest Eco Lodge, Havelock Banglo, and Jetwin Kaduruketa, in addition to over 75 private homes. She consults on environmental design and sustainable development for several international clients and the government of Sri Lanka with environmental innovation being a central feature of her work. She has been selected as a woman of achievement by Zonta International in 2014 as one of the 50 most powerful women in Sri Lanka by Echelon 2013 and 2014 and awarded for outstanding contribution as a woman of Sri Lanka. She is a founding trustee and was the first chairperson of the Federation of Environmental Organizations of Sri Lanka and a founding trustee of the Citizens Initiative Trust Fund, which worked in conflict zones in post-war Sri Lanka. She is also the author of the beautiful book, The Lines of Sri Lanka, Myths and Memories of an Island, a historical travelogue that explores Sri Lanka's more obscure le legends and myths. I added that beautiful part because I love that book. So over to you, Sunela. Please um, moderate the session for us today. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming here. It's, as uh, Shamodi says, it's lovely to see a full audience uh, on a weekday evening. So you may wonder why I am uh, moderating this session. I'm, uh, I'm an environmental architect. and. Uh, why am I moderating a session on edible gardens? Well, it's because that's climate reality. Where is that slide? I am curating a series on, um, uh, it's about smart living, really. So until July, every month, Dilma is bringing you this uh, series of speakers. The whole uh, series uh, is, very, is designed to be very interactive. So even today, um, when we are uh, when we finish the uh, presentations, I'd like you all to uh, really get into a discussion. And then on Saturday, um, there's a follow-up. Uh, so there's a follow-up workshop. Um, but let me first introduce um, your um, speakers today. There's Chan Ekanayaka. Chan is a professional artist and a naturalist. He has experience in designing butterfly gardens with the Forest Department of Sri Lanka and is a guest lecturer at the Faculty of Environmental, Environment Science, University of Colombo, and a guest lecturer at the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Morotua. Chan has also participated in numerous reforesting and organic agriculture projects across the island. Uh, and currently lives in a small scale urban forest garden, conceptualized and grown by him, where he also operates a personal studio and a gallery. So here we have an urban forester. And adding value to urban forestry, it's an edible forest garden. Um, we have Miller Rajendran. Miller is a computer science graduate from the University of Jaffna. He's a tech enthusiast and a serial entrepreneur. Serial entrepreneur, okay. <laughs> in 2016, Miller founded Sens Agro, the first ag tech company in Sri Lanka. As a pioneer, Sens Agro, disrupting the agriculture industry from the root. Now, when I asked him about disrupting agriculture from the root, uh, and I learned something today, he will expand on it. <laughs> because as I thought it was a typo, but it's not. Um, and for the AgTech achievements, Sensagro received the Slush Global Impact Awards in Finland and Climate Launchpad in Edinburgh. 
Miller is a great promoter of startup ecosystems, social enterprises, and sustainable development goals. He's a co-volunteer member of YAL IT Hub, a volunteer-driven startup accelerator based in Jaffna, Sri Lanka. And he's, he's well recognized for prom promoting SDG goals and entrepreneurship among school students. Please uh, welcome uh, Channa and Miller. And uh, <laughs> let's... Uh, and I'll remind you again, the workshop is on Saturday. If you're interested, we have only 25 people. We can only take 25 people, so sign up if you are definitely coming. Um, it, it will be on a first come, first serve basis. And um, there is a, uh, there'll be Buddhika Jala to uh, lead the actual workshop on the ground. Channa will present. Uh, First, with uh, his view on uh, urban agroforestry, which I think will be a good starting point. Thanks, Sunella. Thanks for this rare opportunity uh, to reveal certain uh, uh, events on my life, which is personally uh, attached uh, to uh, a certain gardening. Uh, I started as an uh, uh, basically to uh, get my daily uh, vegetables, but uh, then uh, when it uh, when uh, surrounding neighborhood of my uh, garden become highly urbanized, when they keep cutting trees and. Uh, building new houses. Uh, in certain point, I had to give up slowly uh, my vegetable patches because uh, I realized that certain uh, species, butterflies, birds, spiders and uh, so many other mammals also uh, increasingly uh, they had no where else rather than uh, an edible garden or a forest garden to survive. What I learned was this uh, forest gardening is no more attracting fauna into your garden, but just to give them a chance to survive. So uh, I started to plant uh, endemic and indigenous trees, and while uh, planting these uh, trees, when they grow up, I got another chance to introduce creepers. Creepers, the vines, which take uh, vertical space, the sky space, uh, which give a different type of harvest, either as yams, or otherwise like pods. But at the same time, uh, most of the mornings, I uh, watched uh, so many uh, tiny bees, not the exact honeybees, but in Singhali we call it kaneyu. Uh, those bees were surrounded and roaming around those blooming uh, creepers, because creepers grow fast and making a canopy even above the, uh, the strong trees. And they, they have their own habitat. So slowly, slowly, uh, I introduced more uh, uh, like a type of uh, native uh, uh, Orchids, not exactly orchids, they are like dryneria or bird's nest uh, uh, 
uh, some uh, pepper and uh, other type of wild uh, creepers which are right cling to the trunks and go up. So that is how uh, it's all began. Uh, when uh, it become uh, green and greener, so a uh, lot of people start to uh, comment on it. Their question was about the mosquitoes. Because I am staying, uh, the, the, because of the area where I am staying, uh, that uh, UC and the police uh, health ministry all uh, frequently visit. And uh, they were asking once one single question repeatedly. It is, uh, is it not too much trees? Sometimes I ask, for whom? Whether for them or to me? Then I start to speak to those people and I explain certain things. And also I introduced a pond, garden pond, with guppies and allow the mosquitoes to lay eggs in the water and guppies to feed on them. And also I noticed when there are uh, this oriental mad pyrobin, uh, paradise flycatchers and uh, so many other the birds are started to become habitat in the garden. There are less and less mosquitoes they started to feed on mosquitoes. And uh, also I went through certain YouTube clips uh, how to make a bat nest. And I made a bat nest for the uh, tiny bats in Sri Lanka, not the flying foxes. So bats also eat a lot of mosquitoes. So I allow the nature to control the nature. And the most important thing is, uh, slowly within last 10-15 uh, years, when the butterfly uh, enthusiasm get increased in Sri Lanka through Michael Van der Poten and Himesh and others, that uh, butterfly guidebooks become available more and more. Through those books, we went through their lava, larval feeding plants, their host plants. Then one wonderful truth was unfolds to me, that is, the most of the native edible plants or herbs are the exact larval food plants for the butterflies. Not only for the butterflies, even fireflies. Then, uh, then uh, uh, there were new uh, studies on the spiders. That uh, the spiders uh, who are dwelling in the trees. And uh, the night life, the nocturnal life, becomes so fascinating. Uh, though I have a small urban garden, their completely different life started to appear at night. The spiders around 6, 6.30, 7, they started to view their webs. You can keep watching them. Uh, and fireflies, there are certain trees. Fireflies can be seen uh, more frequently. And then uh, I, I had to uh, learn more about this fauna and flora. Uh, then uh, even uh, I, I got the chance to uh, work with the forest department, the, the wildlife department, uh, and uh, get more and more rare trees. Uh, this uh, Once it getting uh, complete, that is like a closing circle, uh, that it becomes sustainable. Now for an example, uh, 
there's a small herb called uh akkapana uh, akkapana uh, is a traditional uh, sambal a salad because it is easily you can get uh, akkapana leaves cut it into tiny pieces and uh, within no time you can prepare a good salad akkapana also fast growing herb it is like 2 uh, 1 to 2 feet high it needs sun but it never demand for water or fertilizer water less water is good for akkapana in fact the meaning of akkapana is uh, pana is pashana the rock it it's a natural habitat in rocky areas it's like a air plant but what is the magic of this plant that is the host plant for a beautiful red and white butterfly called red peary we can eat the akkapana leaves as a salad red peary is lava also eat akkapana so we share our personal space with another living being sapsand is the most prominent example i went through in my garden i have two big sapsand creepers sapsand young leaves also a good salad or sambal same way as you prepare the akkapana you can make a curry sambal of sapsand young leaves also which is really good for the cough and uh, common cold and flame diseases i forgot to tell you that akkapana is is the uh, is the remedy which you, according to the native medicine for the kidney stones and the gastritis so the point is when you go through the traditional uh, edible garden it is not only edible in the sense of food but also it become has a preventive a therapeutic effect as uh, medicine this uh, not like akkapana this uh, sapsand sapsand is a fairly hard creeper which goes which uh, grow fast vigorously to the tree canopies and the beauty of it is on the higher levels of this creeper the bird wing the ceylon bird wing or sri lankan bird wing the national butterfly of sri lanka lay eggs then the middle part of this uh, creeper the crimson rose another beautiful butterfly love to lay eggs and the lower parts of the same creeper you can see a uh, common roses larva the the caterpillars and they are uh, uh, cocoons and the pupae and the whole metamorphosis different stages of butterfly life but these caterpillars and sometimes these cocoons are again become food for the birds this red red vented bulbul and the common babbler they keep on attacking nature controls nature so my suggestion is when you consider about this uh, uh, edible organic garden uh, if we can try to identify certain native edible species uh, then 
we are giving a better chance for the rest of uh, wildlife uh, to uh, to survive and also the most important thing is they are less maintenance these native plants never demand for high fertilizing pesticide weedicide or much the big space even we if you if you can gain that knowledge about how to harvest and how to deal with different type of the different months of for the different type of harvest through your small garden all over the year your food become uh, highly diverse or the variety of foods can be get from a small space so the it can be either underground or uh, as as leaves or fruits or pods and uh, there are traditionally different type of methods of cooking because straight out of the tree in certain events with certain trees you can't uh, 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 make that uh, fruit into edible so there are certain uh, ways the method to make that hard food into soft to make it edible so this is the main uh, uh, point i want to highlight as uh, as a sri lankan uh, who is living in kalambu uh, still uh, if you have a small space uh, to introduce uh, more species that uh, biodiversity is the most important thing uh, to uh, face this uh, climate uh, calamity because uh, actually uh, uh, when you think deeply this uh, climate change or the global warming is not an environmental uh, problem it is something with our consumer problem it is the over consumption and the wasteful consumption the type of exhibitionism is there the way we in our in our lifestyle so i i would like to highlight this point that what we are dealing today as climate change is not exactly a uh, environmental problem it is more into it is related to consumer over consumption but this over consumption there's another word for it called greediness then if you if you look at deeply about this greediness it is again not a consumption problem it is a mental problem so we have to deal with our attitudes attitudes are more important than the facts so the thing is this whole discussion has to be about a sustainable lifestyle that is straight way of consumption if you allow a jack tree to grow in your garden if you get enough space uh, there must be a ability to cut it get it and eat it so uh, that is the straight forward way of consumption but it is it is bit hard work it, it is simple way you can say it is more primitive way of uh, eating but this primitiveness in a deeper way is more sustainable 
so that is those are few things uh, I have to I I wanted to uh, highlight today. Uh, the Miller will uh, explain to you how this uh, new technology can apply to your edible garden in a more sophisticated, more scientific way. But what I wanted to uh, explain uh, uh, to lay at the base is whatever the technology, uh, whatever the space, we can change our food culture uh, into more uh, native, eco-friendly, uh, and less maintaining uh, manner. If we try to identify our traditional trees uh, and uh, edible uh, plants, uh, we can uh, discuss more later. And uh, on Saturday also, if you wish, we can uh, we can meet uh, for a partly practical session. Thanks. Bye. Right. <coughs> Good evening, guys. Right. So, uh, thank you, Dilma Conservation and Chanda and Sunila and team. Uh, this was a privilege for us to be in this stage uh, as a startup. Uh, so, Sunila, I want to explain why it's called the disruptive words comes on. So, uh, in the startup ecosystem, is very common because uh, we are the first agri-tech company based in Sri Lanka, we started to build technology in the agriculture space uh, since 2016, and we established kind of good numbers right now. So uh, we are exceeding. So conventional farming to disrupting towards uh, a precision agriculture and climate smart agriculture, nothing else, right? It's just the same uh, entrepreneurship word. It's not like destroying agriculture, right? Um, so getting into, uh, I'm Miller, uh, so as Sunil explained, I'm not a farmer or I have an agriculture background like my father and entire family is from agriculture, but uh, I'm a programmer. I'm from computer science background and my, <laughs> my juniors are here. So uh, what's a programmer doing with the farming and um, that's what with the question what we have, but I'm, I'm sit with the majority. I hope most of you guys are, don't have a farming background, but yeah, want to willing to be in the ecosystem. So, um, so it's very simple because it's my business. So I'm into agri-tech, so I started to, just like all the programmers and the computer science guys, I started the holy grail, like Googling it. So I uh, started my journey two, three years back, start Googling all the uh, agricultural terms and become an agronomist from a <coughs> computer science guy to uh, getting involved. So, uh, so in this sense, uh, as a programmer, I see things in a programmatical or modeling base. So uh, Channa explained something on a lifestyle based and it's pretty much on a spiritual and holistic manner where you can fit yourself into the farming and gardening and start your own thing and just feeling it. Uh, my perspective, it's pretty much modeling that because I don't have a formal background of it, so I started to modeling things in more statistical way where you have charts, you can find this what you're supposed to grow, uh, this how you're supposed to do, and it's like I'm working on a software kind of environment. So that's what I'm trying to explain to you guys, where if you can, it's completely based on your preference, but you can fit into it. So I guess it's, it's in pretty much a localized to Sri Lankan and the South Asian continent. So the reference points what we are bringing in. So I hope these documents will be shared with you guys through with the network what we are creating today. So a well-planned garden. That's what my entire topic is. So I'm planning your garden. It's, uh, so Channa's point is the important part. Being in the lifestyle, for me, it's the trust buster. So that's how I see my garden. So this point, I'm, how I get into this. So programmatical way, modeling it, everything by planning. So every single garden is supposed to start with the environmental monitoring. So you're supposed to understand what your environment is, how much sunlight your garden getting in, whether you want to increase it or decrease it by putting a shade or removing some roofing top, or what's the temperature. Sri Lanka itself, uh, Sri Lanka is a country where it's pretty humid. 
around Sri Lanka. If you have more temperature, I mean high temperature with humidity, any plant will face a concept called heat stroke. That's not good for, a, good for a plant. So we're supposed to understand what's your exact background of your farm or your space, what you have in terms of your environment. It's very easy to understand your environment and planning your crop, planning your space, planning your method of farming, planning your farming patterns, crop cycles, everything based on the environment monitoring. So you're starting with by understanding for a one week period, understand with sensors or something. Then your preference based on your crop, what kind of vegetable you want or what kind of garden you're supposed to look or feel, that kind of preferences. Then how much your space you have to grow and time, how much time you can allocate, maybe budget also. So for all these things concerned and planned before starting your farm, this is completely by Googling it, and I put it everything into a merged form. So basically, you can save plenty of life, plant life, basically. Or you start, actually, to experiment our technology, honestly, we kill plenty of plants, unfortunate, to testing out our thing. So then only we're starting our models and so on. So before pl planning for your garden, plan well ahead of it. So then you uh, save plenty of life, not killing it. So. Understanding us environment. So every crop have a environment to fit in. So as Tanna preferred, native plants usually have uh, plenty of suitability for your environment. So preferred native plants. Without any thinking, you can go for it. So there are plenty of heat-loving plants, like salad cucumber. In Western province, we have plenty of salad cucumber farmers doing it in commercial scale with greenhouses and so on. So you can choose your crop based if it's native, or you can find crops which, based on your environment, what your findings are. Use sensors, thermosters, small kits, which talk about. So I have a small unit here. This unit is close to $12. It's in online, you can buy out, which communicating with your phone, which talk about what's the environment temperature, how much light you are getting, what's your soil moisture level, and your soil fertility level. $12 done. So this kind of parameter checking is pretty important for you before starting your crop cycle. So get a chart, what are the crops, what are the preferences you have, and plan for the environment based on it. So, or making small arrangement if you have a preferred plant to grow for it. So choosing the crop. This is completely based on the space and your preference and your budget and so on. So basically, uh, a cycle of crop uh, talking about you're supposed to have, in a garden, you're supposed to have herbs, fruits, flowers, roots, vegetables, and herbs again. So the main reason, uh, herbs comes in different forms, roots, leafy, leafy greens, and so on. So the, these, you're supposed to choose in a way which is complementing each other. So I will release you a chart, which I find it from internet. So I have plenty of resources where you can share with you. So these resources will give you an idea what kind of crop complementing each other and what kind of crop you can grow closer, closer to each other. So if you have this kind of rotation, not only you, your need will be fulfilled, at the same time, uh, it will create an ecosystem. Flowers, main focus, to give a pleasant look and feel for your garden. At the same time, it will help uh, your other plants, like vegetables and so on, to making pollinization. Pollination is one of the main cause you growing flowers. So it's supposed to be an ecosystem what you have to create. So this chain need to be developed in your garden. And the space need to be allocated based on your requirement. So there are plenty of plant charts. This is one of the examples. So you know how big a plant can be. Goa, how big space you're supposed to have. A lemon tree, how big space you're supposed to have. A carrot farm, how big a space supposed to have. So there are plenty of charts which talk about uh, how a usual per person, per month, what's the edible rate for a particular crop, particular plant, particular vegetable, and so on. So you can choose based on the preference. It's completely based on the preference. You just list out what are the preferred stuff you're supposed to have, and just draw a graph and talk about the tilling or the slope of your garden. You can plant uh, most um, uh, water required plants in the lower area where your water sink will be there, and higher ground for the dry plant zone. So you can plan based on it. So 
the space allocation is very important. Every single crop have its own space allocation when it's grow, or else it, it will compete each other for sunlight, nutrition, and so on. It's pretty important. So commercial scale farming also happening like that. So coconut trees is supposed to put every 24 feet one, or cashew plant 40 feet one plant. So that kind of crop spacing is a must even in gardening. So there are few methodologies you can use. So this is how, these are widely used methods. Uh, if you don't have a ground, may, basically if you are growing in balconies or uh, even in the ground, if you don't find equal nutrition in the ground, if it's a newly made ground which is more sandy soil with cement mixed and so on, you can go for a different perspective. If you want a soil-based farming to be done, you can have a rise up plant, rise up garden. So this is very easy to develop. Uh, if you have very small in our spaces, you can go vertical also. So it's completely DIY, do it yourself. It's, it's, you don't need an expert to develop these things. Or you can have a microclimate environment. You can have more control if you go for a pot based or grow back based. This is the most uh, new, new version what we have uh, so far. In Sri Lanka, there are coir beds. You can have multiple crops onto it in the middle one. The grow backs, you're creating individual nutrition status in the soil or the medium what we are growing, or you can create a separate location. You can move around based on the environment. So this is more convenient in terms of if you are developing some a garden in gar in the city or the urban area. In a more sustainable way, the third place you can reuse your uh, your previous clothes or old clothes into bags creating grow bags. So these are some new methods people using it at the moment to create a mobile or very sustainable and free, time, free space uh, farming environments. If you can spend more time and a little bit more money, uh, the best option is like a recycling farming like aquaphonic and hydrophonic. I think on 1st of February, the workshop will contain all these aspects. You can go and have a hands-on uh, experience based on this. So. This needs a little bit of technology and guidance to grow, but previous to, it's completely a normal materials that you are growing, but based on your space, your preference, and the environment, uh, and the budget, you can choose what kind of a, a farming methodology you're planning on. So it's completely based on crop, uh, crop rotation also. So in terms of technology, so this is one of it. So if you're a grow back or a small garden, you can just plug in, your mobile will talk about it. So it's just a banding part. So this is what I'm doing, uh, creating sensors for plant and uh, giving precise information what your plant looking for and so on and controlling the irrigation and fortigation in the industrial scale. So you can plan, the word plan is pretty important. So the irrigation and everything you can plan based on it. So have your plant rows coming in and you can plan, plan for drip irrigation and uh, sprinklers or you can go for rain hose mechanisms based on the irrigation. If you have irrigation mechanism unless you are just pouring water by hand, you can save plenty of time by scheduling it, controlling it. You can control your mechanism from remote access. Wherever you go, you don't want to carry your farm. Everything will be on your mobile. That's what the proposition, what the new technology bringing up. So uh, hope you guys understand about, the, uh, you know about the crowdfunding, right? Plenty of people around the world funding for a particular project. Something similar in Japan and various places, there are crowdfunded farms where you can farm remotely. It will guide you uh, in apartment. You can grow stuff. They will grow on behalf of you. You're just funding them and you see what you have to do. You pour water just like a game. There are farms, crowdfunded farms or crowdsourced farms available around the world. You can be part of it. You can grow a tomato uh, bush uh, in Japan from Sri Lanka. That kind of a facility is available at the moment. But Having something in your own garden is something else, right? That's the essence what we try to bring in. So something advanced. So these are crazy stuff, people using it for farming. So this is a weed robot, So which is it's a small solar panel one, just like a turtle. You just put it in, uh, which is looking for different type of leaves popping up from the, your garden, which is just spin off and cut it off. So there are people come up with various technologies, putting millions of dollars to grow technologies in the garden space. Because people understand uh, the retail chain of farming and the consumer in farm to fork, there are plenty of misunderstandings, plenty of wastages, plenty of hustles. 
plenty of GMOs uh, and chemical reactions and so on. So having something close to the consumer end, what's the preferred mechanism around the world? So urban farming and household farming and organic farming is preferred and people are, there is a huge movement happening at the moment. So be the part of being the active, active movement, something important at the moment. So then you have planned your plants and you have a garden space, you plan for it, you design it, you root it, then the problems comes in. When you become a doctor, before you, by planning it, you save plenty of life, now you're curing the issue, uh, diseases what you have, just like a doctor. So there are charts for this as well. So, so this is pretty important to understand, to plan your entire crop, crop rotation based on the season, based on uh, the space and so on. So there are plenty of guides. These links will be shared with you. So individually for vegetables and herbs, I create a complete uh, list of guidelines. These all lead you to a particular uh, vegetable and you can learn about it uh, and start growing about it. Um, so this is a completely informative and uh, planning for your plan. So that's how I did it. I hope this will work for you as well. And it's completely based on your preference. Just have fun. This is just a cheat code, right? Thank you so much. We'll have a more chat on the session. Thank you. Chanda and Miller come at uh, agriculture from two completely different directions. Um, and Actually, that's why I wanted the two of them here, because to show you the range of uh, approaches. Um, this could apply to uh, your tiny balcony. Both their, both their approaches could apply to your tiny balcony, or to your urban garden, or to uh, a very large extent of land. And it's actually about preference. It's what, how do you want to approach it? What what really resonates with you, which approach resonates with you. Um, and I think the commonality that I noticed in what you all were both saying is how you plan and what you plan for. So what you're prioritizing. Now, Channa uh, is where he started from and where he's at, I think, now is more about um, sharing uh, the space with other species. So. I think it's about sharing your space, building a complete ecosystem. Miller's is more about uh, productivity when you have limited time, space, and and uh, funding to some extent is not really a problem, uh, or, it, or it's you're willing to spend that money because you can't afford the time. Chana's, the way I understood it, is more um, sort of that holistic, spiritual joy that, uh, you know, seeing your plants grow and, uh, you know, uh, picking your own salad kind of uh, approach. So it's actually two completely different things. And then there is everything in between where you can actually have a hybrid system of either, uh, you know, part Chana, part Miller's approaches, so high technology plus, um, you know, in, in the process you build that ecosystem. So what um, I think I'm, I'm going to just open this up to the audience because at the workshop you all will see how this is actually put in the ground and how the uh, Buddhika who's not with us today unfortunately will lead the workshop and Chan and Miller will both be there as well and uh, you all can uh, whoever is able to come that day will see the actual methodology because you know I think that's something that really needs to be hands on. Hello, thank you. That was very interesting from uh, both different perspectives. Uh, while I understand that you know your second point was on preference, if we are trying to create change and also drive this, especially amongst the younger generation, uh, Mila, do you have you know in the terms of a cheat sheet what might be the easier plants to first start people off on? Because I mean whilst there's preferences that people like, I think especially when we're trying to bring this into schools, et cetera, that scientific method and the little gadget that you showed, those are really quick plug and play options that we have. And we, with time being of essence, those things really go a long way because lots of people talk about planning gardens, et cetera. But for you to be really bought in, you need to first have some sort of success. 
uh, especially with the younger generation. So maybe something, and maybe Dilma can think of this for Saturday, to have an end-to-end -end solution of a small garden you can start off with, right? And lots of people will appreciate if there is the sort of, you know, taking a general garden, say, in Colombo or in a few areas, you know, where you're, you know the humidity, you know the sort of space people usually have, and kind of come up with a little template that might be really helpful to get lots of people started as in, you know, as opposed to going through all the, um, you know, options available. Is that possible? Uh, it's kind of possible, but it's, uh, again, based on the preference, uh, I would say, like, because even Sri Lanka have a beautiful climate, uh, people growing strawberries, blueberries, and so on. So you can grow anything, but you, if but the only thing, you need to set up the environment based on it. So creating a small polytunnel structure within the within Colombo, within your house garden, it's not a big thing. With your do, DIY, you can do it. So creating an environment for whatever the crop, that's the important part. Uh, but it's always better to choose the native plants. That's the first preference, because as Channa said, it needs less care less resources. So so I, I will give a small example, uh, the, the same thing I explained to you on that day. So uh, we had, uh, uh, my family is coming from a Kira farming environment, right? So this is in Colombo, by the way. So uh, we had like close to 20, 30 acres land space just after Colombo, and uh, which was completely uh, dumped garbages and on top of it they put soil and a private company so they have a huge space where uh, they are storing huge containers and all it's a container yard right now but eventually we had like it's very close to Kalani river so eventually we had a very good water but uh, now it's completely contaminant but after two three years the ecosystem yield itself so now we have different exotic varieties, but it's pretty, uh, not exotic, it's completely native plants. It's growing itself without any care, and it's bringing plenty of ecosystem, like uh, birds, different varieties of uh, butterflies, and so on. So you don't need a care if you're going for a native plant. We have plenty of hybrid stuff which grow, which need care, but now without anything, even in a contaminant water, you can grow something with native. So choosing native plants which is completely uh, apt for your environment or your, new, your new localization, it can grow itself. But it's completely based on a season also. So based on the season, we can guide farmers, this is the season for next three months, if you grow this, there's a, there's a seasonal chart also. So you can guide them based on that. Uh, and so there's nothing we can teach about, there's no special chart which is the holy grail. It's completely based on preference, you can grow anything. There's no restriction for it. Uh, I have a question. I would like to know, like, vertical garden out of plastic bottles, like, you know, we are wasting. Uh, what are the, like, you know, it's fo it should be focused uh, with the sea. So the, the breezing has to be, you know, focused on, like, you know, I tried so many ways, but most of the plants die because of the sea breeze. So what are the best plants you can recommend for sea breeze to coexist? So there are mangroves. Uh, if you go through our, uh, so uh, my office space in Marine Drive. So we have plenty of mangrove. I have, we have a very beautiful garden. Uh, at the same time, if you see plenty of five star orals, they grow mangroves as the barrier points, like a, a, a live fence, which is protecting your plants from the seaweed. But as you said, it's a big hustle with the salty water in the air. It's very big hustle in if you grow something on the um, sea breeze. Uh, but you can choose something based on it if you can give a cover and so on. But certain extent Without only. Without cover, what are the, because I have a project I'm focusing. Sorry? I have a project I'm focusing along with the stations, railway stations. So that doesn't have any cover because it's fully exposed. Yeah. So I'm focusing on the uh, pet bottles as well as the. Uh, the, like you know organic things thing and then it's basically open to air so I have a real problem and I thought of you know certain flowers but flowers like minimal is in a way no. it's it can be done because it's there at the moment but I would want something something kind of a uh, the uh, 
a kind of a garden type of a thing where people can garden is very rare but if you want to grow and keep it greenery so i saw plenty of projects is going goes with mangroves so sea salt water mangroves are very much protective it can grow in what kind of this kind of environment especially uh, in valley oyer and jaffna also you can see plenty of mangroves in this kind of sea beds they growing for as a, even as a garden and a, a look and feel also it's better I, i really want to search for it because i i am as i said like i'm googling for it right <laughs> uh, not exactly be boxes is it don't uh but uh in my garden i have four pots big color yeah? and uh, yesterday after this long rainy season the new uh, bee hive with the queen came and settled down uh, in one of the color yeah? uh and today this morning they unfortunately decided to get removed from that habitat and they shifted to another color yeah? so when there is a chance for them to decide uh, you can get uh, bees but uh, i have no intention to get harvest i am giving uh, them an uh, uh, dwelling places habitats uh in my garden i have seven uh, coconut trees i think those coconut trees are the main nectarine uh, trees for the bees uh my question is to uh, miller miller uh, can i know the name of that unit you were talking about uh, yeah yes uh, this is called uh, mi flora mi flora we call uh, flower care uh that's a this is work in bluetooth so basically this is around 12 uh, dollars you can find in ebay or ali aliexpress or somewhere so basically this is communicating with your mobile within 10 meter gap so you plugging in and your in real time your app will show what uh what your condition is um it's communicating with bluetooth that's it it's a very simple just like your wearable watch and bracelet which communicating with your mobile uh which talk about the moisture level uh in 6 cm deep that's what the active root space uh then the ec the ec mean the salinity level uh, which basically talk about the fertility content iron values of the soil uh then the environmental temperature uh, ambient temperature and the light level which is talk in lux level pH it won pH basically uh, there is no soil based pH uh, sensors available in the world uh, but there are solution based one so if you wanted to check in the water content or drain water you can you can monitor uh, which is like close to 5000 rupees per sensor i have been involved in this for 32 years we started the organic farm movement can be said as an no now the most important thing is soil Unfortunately, nobody spoke about soil. The first and foremost thing is soil, and soil means bacteria, fungi, viruses. So the first thing is to care for the soil. You heal the soil. How do you heal the soil? By putting in leaves, the thing that you find in the forest. I just came <coughs> from the. <coughs> We had a mother in part, and sad, and sad. They are trying to have an endemic forest. Lord help us! Not a single leaf on the ground. How do you grow that? Now I have tried, and now I use my garden 30-20 percent near dirt forest. I have soil that is now so rich you don't need it you just can dig it your fingers it is so soft all the rain that falls just get absorbed it doesn't throw anywhere it's like a huge big sponge this is what parakram bahu the great was talking about he says not one drop of water goes to the sea 30% of sri lanka's water that falls in kalamu goes to the sea not one drop of mine Have a good time. All good. I hope my dream is that we make an agro forest of the whole of Kerala, the community garden that poor people can go and eat. Now 
I'm starting a community garden right at the start, in front of there. And already people are coming and taking their curry leaves and whatever they can take from there. Go and sell it, that's okay. That's my community. The poor people do not have. But we can all do this. We can all do this in all our lives. We can do it in balconies. You can have an idea of growing up. <coughs> The idea that even gives Allah on the wine that you can cook via the importing potatoes for goodness sake. We have got over 50 varieties of Allah in Sri Lanka. Leaves, I only eat leaves. For the last 12 years, I have not eaten rice, bread, or sugar. I am 84 years old and I can spit 50 meters. That is the tragedy. That is the tragedy. I get foreigners coming to see my God because somebody put it on Facebook or whatever. And this lady now heard me many, many years ago and she wants to see the God. You see, the most important thing now, as Santa was saying, grow what grows naturally. You can eat all these things. Now I only eat stuff from my girl. You don't have to buy it. My wife wants rice, okay, so I buy all rice. Thank you, sir. I've been rice for 12 years. Thank you, sir. Yep. Thank you. That was a wonderful example of uh, growing your own garden, living to 84, sprinting 50 meters. Yes, I'm. Um, all, all against white bread and all that myself. And yes, organic is the way forward. But I, I think um, a lot of us don't have that opportunity. Uh, sometimes 20 purchase is not possible for everyone. So I, I think there, that's where we have to begin with um, supplementing uh, what we buy. But we have to start somewhere. And that's what's really important, that we start even with just one edible plant. Uh, so I think that's what we want to really emphasize with this series. Start, don't wait. Start with just a single pot of anything that you can add to your uh, meal. And uh, is there any, anyone else? Uh, do is uh, in order to plant like you know uh, let's say different types of like known plants they just remove the unknown ones which actually have uh, you know which are edible which might be giving you more nutrition so just want to uh, just ask the panel to see if there are any databases of home uh, like native plants that can, that might uh, come up on your home garden which might be edible edible or which might be having a medicinal usage uh, yeah, yeah the, that is a very good question because we are within last uh, uh, 12 years there was a research done and uh, four books were published, uh, covered uh, nearly uh, 40 different uh, areas uh, by collecting the traditional knowledge on uh, native wild plants which can be edible and how to make it into edible. Because certain fruits you can't uh, get straight out of the tree. We have to go through a certain process. That is what you call traditional knowledge. So uh, I have one of the books, uh, I, I wrote it here. Uh, later I'll show it to you. But it is in Singhala. It is a collection of uh, uh, the plants plus the way how to cook it. That recipe is there and the, and the medicinal value is there to which, uh, uh, which diseases this can be a remedy like that. It is a, a good collection and the book series is uh, uh, there. So uh, uh, I think uh, we can share that uh, knowledge with you. And also, I have to. I am so happy to hear 
uh, about, uh, his description about uh, the soil. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I forgot totally uh, to uh, tell something about uh, this uh, topsoil top soil of my garden. Uh, I never burn anything. Daily, early in the morning, and again in the evening, I have to sweep and collect the fallen leaves and uh, I keep it at the end of my garden and uh, at the parapet wall. This parapet wall, wall is uh, uh, bordering to uh, abundant land, uh, partly marsh, and uh, then uh, uh, it, that uh, marsh uh, bordering to the one now. So uh, what I have done is I made a small hole at the bottom of that uh, my uh, boundary wall at night the mongoose uh, other rats uh, and at the daytime uh, land lizards all are coming to feed on that uh, uh, composting thing because uh, at night I put all the uh, leftover food to that same thing and I I do, uh, uh, for me, it's no need to uh, uh, turn. They do themselves for me. They work for me because that is the win-win situation. I allow them to make an habitat and also there was, a, uh, there was a, an old uh, small slab of concrete. So I just lifted it up for two and a half uh, feet above the ground with the help of the bricks and now it is horizontally it is the uh, daytime uh, hiding place and the breeding place for the mongoose so they they control the snails uh, and they uh, help me to make the compost so topsoil is the most important thing a nation if a nation uh, neglect the, its uh, real treasure, the real value, which is called topsoil, uh, it, is, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is the biggest calamity. I'm totally agree with you and I'm happy to you. I, I'm glad to visit your garden. Sorry, I'm barging in the interesting conversation. Don't forget to fill out that small sheet that you have. That feedback will help us to have more sessions like this. Thank you. Make sure that uh, in sustainable agriculture, in future, that microplastic does not come into our system. Let's say it can come through water, it can even come through soil. I don't want that to be accumulated into our body, such as mercury and other heavy metals. So how do you suggest that we could prevent these microplastic coming into our system through this sustainable or the modernized agricultural methods? So microplastic is everywhere. So if you see, our ocean is completely filled. We already made the damage. So not only microplastics, so even all the herbicide, pesticide and everything what you are using is going underground and so we talking about saving the water, underground water and all, it's already contaminant. So it goes down and run off, then it's contaminating the groundwater as well. So the so only thing we need to stop and do something from the beginning and uh, it eventually take time. Microplastic also, it's another hustle, it's, it's not a solution but a normal urban farmer can do. It's a completely a global scale procedure we're supposed to take it forward. Maybe recycle and upcycle and reducing wastage is going dump. So it's just a precaution what we can do. It's already damage is done. So getting rid of it takes a huge amount of time. That's that's what we all discussing right now, climate change, right? So it's a global issue and in Finland maybe it's a opportunity. Right. Yes. Make sure you eat small fish and do not eat Sri Lankan salt. Right. <laughs> right. The microplastics are, are, are all over. Actually, you now some supermarkets are selling uh, not the Siri Siri bag, but a certain kind of bag, which is again uh, plastic. But that actually contributes to microplastic uh, because they don't decay. You know, a lot of people think just because uh, the bag is out of sight. The plastic is out of sight. No. Plastic is in very small pieces in my, at micro level is there. 
So the best thing is not to put any silly silly bags or any plastic material into your compost. And if you can stop it, yes, at your home garden, you can prevent microplastics from getting accumulated. That's the only solution. But it's available elsewhere, you cannot help it. So if you can prevent any silly silly bags or any other plastic material, if you feel anything plastic, you know, these common plastic bags, you know, with a handle, it's not cloth, it's again plastic, but that um, uh, disintegrates into very small microplastics, and there is a danger. And as he suggests, that uh, it's better to <laughs> not to eat large fish, but eat uh, smaller fish. Because in the food pyramid, uh, you contain it at that level. Right, thank you. Excuse me. I have small comments regarding the diagnosing the plant diseases. Nowadays, we have uh, mobile applications available. There are a few applications. One, Plantex. Uh, Plantex is one good uh, application. Within a uh, second, it's uh, diagnose your diseases and come up with uh, uh, traditional solutions, biological solutions, and the chemical solutions. You can download it uh, free of charge from the Play Store. Exactly. Uh, not only uh, Plantex, there are a few apps also. So the only thing, uh, Plantex also don't have our native local products databases. So it, it, but it's trainable. So that's the contribution, as one gentleman asked. So the databases, the contribution, that's the issue. Uh, so we're building plant modeling with AI and machine learning. So for tech guys, you understand like you're supposed to have a huge amount of data to train for a particular thing. So as a community, that's what we are missing. We are not contributing to the uh, intelligence what is supposed to carry on for the next generation. We don't have a one particular database which we can talk about. There are plenty of resources. Even EDB have all the guidance for plants and a uh, few government resources have, websites have this information, but there is no database as you such. And Plantex also, uh, they have plenty of plant modeling. If you search for a big data set uh, in Google, you can find for vineyards, olive, wheat, soya beans, which are native foreign product and it's globally doing, people doing cultivation. There are plenty of researchers and data providing happening on that, but for native product, we don't have any databases at all. Even for tea, except for the quality tea, silver tip and so on only we have, we don't have much resources which going deeper into, so vineyards, people doing sensing for leaf moisture, which is improving the quality of the wine. So that kind of deep level researches we don't do in any crop which is available in Sri Lanka. So that kind of cumulative uh, resources, resource polling is not happening in this environment. So this kind of forum will motivate those things. And for the microfiber, uh, maybe this is a kind of a personal opinion, maybe it's supposed to made it as a financial making model, then only it will be vanished. Like it's someone need to see this as an opportunity like these guys. So I know these are my juniors from my university. So they're working on recycling and upcycling technologies. They are working on nanotechnology and so on. So you can show one of the brick if you have. So this is, uh, this is a replacement for uh, bricks, right? But it's made out of a mixture of cement and plastic. So a little bit of my nanotechnology involved in it. So this research is happening in Jaffna, so these guys are researchers from this, so I just invite them to be part of it. So these are the things, if it's become commercial, then people try to do, plenty of people try to do a recycle and upcycle. It will not going to be vanished, but it will be reduced. So it become an opportunity for someone, someone's hustle become an opportunity. So that's the only model we can overcome this kind of global scale issues. What? I want to support China. Yes. See, people don't realize hybrid plants, hybrid, produce nice fruits, everything fine, but a forest grown plant has to fight the insects, has to attract the insect. All these things make that plant to grow very strong antioxidants, vitamins, what have you. So eating a raw plant that is forest grown is full of nutrients. One that is grown nicely protected, you know, like the Israelis in a nice thing, no insects coming, all given uh, chemicals down there, aquaponics, all these little very nice fruit. Okay. What is there inside? What is there inside? Like you and I. If you want to be strong, you need stresses. And that's what 
So, I think forest grown plants, and I think Madhura, yeah, who has a question, he has a lovely forest garden. Uh, so, I think I, it's, it was the same thing that I want to harp on because most of the time we don't get uh, uh, native plants like fruits and vegetables because anyway most of our plants are, I mean fruit plants are not need, I mean not endemics but mostly ca they came to Sri Lanka. But now due to hybrids we don't find, we don't find uh, our own native plants. For example guava, we have this kilo guava, right? Uh, which is not tasty at all, and even uh, even fugu uh, or rose apple, we have the hybrids. Everywhere are all the hybrids. Just a uh, idea for Dilma, we have to save the genes, because I know in Malaysia, definitely they don't have the original genes now. So if Dilma can have uh, a nursery, like everybody can support, like for example, even Veralu now, still they don't have uh, hybrids, but one fine day they will have a hybrid for Veralu. So just to keep the native genes, we can have um, nurseries growing uh, all native plants, fruits, just to keep the genes uh, available for future generations. Because in this trend, I don't think the native fruits and uh, even vegetables will survive. Yes. Uh, thanks, Madhura. Um, and I, I agree with you 100% because uh, actually uh, I am a proponent of uh, indigenous species, heirloom species. There's a gentleman here who's been helping uh, me with uh, uh, finding heirloom uh, seeds. And I think that's the way forward because from my personal experience, uh, I know that when you grow indigenous plants, the soil recovers much faster than with any other species. And certainly, uh, monocrops are a disaster uh, because they'll deplete the soil of a particular uh, set of minerals and leave the rest or whatever. But um, I think, yes, Dilma, we can charge them with setting up um, nurseries because I'll say it quite openly, the forest department has failed. Um, they have nothing, if you go to their nurseries, uh, a rare nursery will have some species, but most of them uh, will still sell you uh, teak and, um, and uh, eucalyptus and uh, all sorts of utter nonsense. But if you ask them for our indigenous species, they look completely blank. But there are nurseries, uh, some of the Ayurveda department nurseries are very good, and uh, there are private nurseries which are really good. But I think uh, for all of us to start building up seed banks, uh, obviously it's something of your preference, but as I said again, I'm a proponent of uh, indigenous species and particularly alu. Build up your seed banks, pull together, um, a group of friends, uh, family, create garden clubs, um, have seed exchanges, they can be quite fun. If you are in an apartment building, find uh, you know neighbors who might be interested. You uh, meet once, um, you know, every few months, uh, exchange seeds, keep a progress of, uh, you know, how your, each, each one's garden is progressing. Meet and uh, share the labor in your uh, gardens when you can. Um, I think that's the way forward because there are lots of people who are just getting into this. There are people who are more confident and sharing that knowledge, sharing that experience is uh, the way to get this ball rolling. I think it's time for us to wind up. So. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so that, that is definitely something to remember. Um, and uh, so um, I think we'll have to wind up. I hope you have signed up for uh, Saturday, whoever is able to come. Because I think there you'll see, you know, how the plants go into the ground. You'll see hydroponics, you'll see aquaponics, vertical gardening. They have all the systems at the uh, Dilma. Um, uh, garden in uh, Moratua. So hopefully we'll meet you there and uh, thank you very much for your participation and uh, I hope uh, that you all are all picking your own uh, lunches and dinners in a few months. Thank you. Thank you Miller, thank you Chan. So before we wrap up <laughs> 
Thank you for um, staying throughout, and thank you for the enthusiastic interaction. Thank you, our resource pe uh, three resource pe persons and the panel. So now um, I have a couple of announcements, and also now let me invite Mrs. Shirani Asaratna, the former country coordinator for IUCN and the chief consultant for Biodiversity Sri Lanka, and the chief advisor to Dilma Conservation to hand over the token of appreciation for the panel. Just for the photo. Thank you. Uh, to Miller and Chana. So thank you so much. Uh, please hand, hand over the completed uh, evaluation sheets to the registration desk. And also don't forget to enjoy a cup of Dilma tea uh, with some snacks served from uh, Cafe Brew, also from Dilma. Uh, it's served in the lobby. Uh, there are some couple of interesting publications at a print cost. You can just check them out also at the res uh, registration desk if you have missed that already. And uh, if you still want to sign up for the workshop, that is available at the desk again. Uh, if the number of registrants are high, we have to divide it into, into two sessions, maybe two dates. We'll let you know. We'll contact those who have signed up for the workshop. We'll let you know. It's going to be from 9.30 to 12.30, right? Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. See you again.